What's up, y'all? How it be going? And, uh, <clears throat> um, here with another update. It's uh, two days before Christ Mass. Thursday, the 23rd of December. And, uh, yeah, I had so much news on my phone that I figured I'd come do a little ooper date. <clears throat> um, as always, tell you guys, go uh, watch this on the YouTube if you're not watching it live. And to watch it live, go to twitch.tv slash free trying to post. Sub, hit that bell. you get all the notifications. Do the same thing on the YouTubers. And uh, you'll never miss a video. Uh, do periodically go check that, though, because YouTube seems to sometimes unsubscribe people, but definitely unring your bell for you. So uh, I don't know if that's on purpose or if that is because just updates or something. I don't know. I'm not trying to accuse them of anything. I'm just saying it has happened in the past. So, yeah, check that periodically. But, yeah, we're always up on there. And, uh, yeah, of course, if you can watch it uh, on, with video, it's always going to be better. First, you'll get to see this beautiful logo that we've got up right now. And then, in addition to that, you'll be able to read the articles along with me. And um, if I end up taking questions, if I get some interesting questions, those will likewise uh, be up on the screen. So you'll be able to read those. I will try to read... Uh, most of the things I'm commenting on out loud. So if you do listen to audio, hopefully you're not missing too much. But, you know, sometimes we miss a little something. I'm not perfect, y'all. I'm pretty close, but I'm not quite perfect. Uh, so I do my best. Um, that all being said, yeah, you can also watch. I'll, I'll post the video in the description of the uh, on the website as well, freechannapost.com. I'll show you all that in a minute. Uh, so that, uh, along with all the links, if you want to uh, do your own research, you can go over there and uh, check out those links, which I recommend you do, because you get even more uh, details, uh, you know? And uh, you should be doing your own research, folks. Uh, otherwise, you're messing up. Um, all right, let's pop into her here. So, I had a couple of recent stories of FBI agents infiltrating uh, protest movements. Whether those are ones I agree with or not isn't really the point, but it is looking like more and more entrapment is happening. So, this is talking about um, protests in 2020 in Portland, uh, like these Black Lives Matter protests uh, in the wake of of the murder of George Floyd. Uh, so, yeah, there's just, you know, evidence coming out all the time. I mean, people were saying this at the time. If you know anything about history, you know this This isn't new. It's not like this is like, ooh, this is unprecedented. Um, I mean, the FBI legit, uh, I mean, they used to just kill people back in the day. Let's be honest about that. Um, people like Fred Hampton, for instance. So, uh, yeah. It's definitely happening. Um, I'm not going to read a ton of this. I just wanted to kind of uh, show this, uh, show you, you know, give put some of these down in the description box and make sure, you know, everyone's aware of it, uh, that you should be uh, <laughs> calling for accountability and uh, the end of entrapment by uh, uh, FBI agents. So you also had some of these stories. Um, this is, this is uh, also about Portland. Um, but you also have, um, uh, like, in January 6th, so you have uh, undercover officers basically, um, yeah, trying to push uh, some of these uh, would-be, uh, whatever you want to call them, uh, rioters, looters, um, yeah, going into the Capitol building on, on uh, January 6th. I know that's a big deal for... Uh, for a lot of people on Capitol Hill, um, they're having you know like the big you know big 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 hearings and big trials right now. But um, haven't heard much talk about this from Congress. Uh, not necessarily surprising, but perhaps some of these FBI agents should be called in to explain why um, you know the FBI uh, was uh, trying to encourage this sort of behavior and put. Uh, Congress people's lives at risk. 
So yeah, that's uh, it's been happening. Um, there was uh, you know this is another story that happened uh, last year in 2020. Um, there were uh, the FBI was involved in this one as well. The kidnapping of or the plot, I should say, the plot to kidnap um, Gretchen Whitmer, who's the governor of Michigan. So, yeah, that was a thing. Um, and then there's this article. Um, this one's a little old, but there are a number of them. But I just sh- use this to show you that these are ones that you usually don't hear about. And they're talking about these ones because these are, you know, hot articles right now. Black Lives Matter protests and also January 6th. Uh, uh, capital storming um, are obviously hot and in the news right now, but even when you know when everyone was pushing this uh, radical Muslim terrorist destroying America, um, a lot of them were also arrested and sent to jail. A lot of of Muslims were arrested and sent to jail. Some of them for uh, decades uh, because they were basically radicalized by FBI agents. So um, yeah. Uh, those people should be freed, um, um, or at least have their sentences uh, greatly reduced, because it seems this is like clear entrapment. Um, there are a number of stories here, and this doesn't obviously doesn't cover all the stories. There are tons, tons of different stories. Um, one I read not too long ago is that of like a young, socially maladjusted Muslim boy that the FBI <coughs> pretended to be. A girl interested in him and basically radicalized him through that, telling him, like, oh, you know, if you do this, this terrorist plot will, uh, you know, I'll, I'll marry you or whatever. I'll love you. Blah, 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 blah. Um, real, real sick stuff. Um, so just want everyone to be aware of that. Like I said, you should read, read up more on this. Um, and uh, maybe I'll do like a deep dive episode on just uh, <laughs> how, how the, uh, Three-letter agencies are are uh, probably much worse than some of, some of y'all think. Um, moving on to a more positive, interesting story is uh, the title of this article is Chinese pressure fuels an unlikely language revival in Taiwan. Um, so basically, they're arguing in this article that, um, and with some evidence, as, uh, I mean, obviously with evidence as well, um, that basically Chinese pressure and a uh, rapidly dwindling uh, section of the population in Taiwan identifying as uh, Chinese, <clears throat> it's something like 2%, like slightly over 2% that identifies only as uh, Chinese now in Taiwan. Uh, with that dropping so quickly, yeah, 27 is what it says here. Um, w- with that dropping so quickly in this um, growing hostility, from China, uh, military, uh, like, uh, literally militarily with them flying uh, jets into Taiwan's ADIZ, um, and, um, you know, also with rhetoric of them, uh, you know, always doing the, uh, our Taiwanese compatriots and things like that, uh, and talking about their willing willingness and desire uh, to violently murder half the population and try to take over Taiwan. Um, more and more people are turning away from that and actually turning to Taiwanese as an uh, a way to differentiate themselves from from uh, those in China from the, the Chinese nation. Now, it should be said that uh, there is already a difference, actually uh, a decent amount of linguistic difference. Decent is a pretty vague term, but uh, obviously the writing styles are quite different because. Uh, China uses simplified characters, and Taiwan uses uh, traditional characters, um, which, I mean, I'm obviously hugely biased, but I think traditional characters are more beautiful and can hold more meaning, etc., etc. Obviously, it's much more convenient, quicker to study simplified and write simplified, so um, there is that argument, but um, with how little people write by hand anymore, I think there's, there's no real reason to learn simplified unless you're writing shorthand for notes or something whatever Uh, i know a lot of people in taiwan i I don't know if i should say a lot anecdotally i know some students um 
and Ari even will write certain words uh, in simplified because it's just quicker. Um, but like when writing formally, obviously everyone uses traditional. And uh, yeah, that's uh, that, that. And there's also uh, linguistic differences in the spoken language as well. Um, there's a number of different words that are used. Uh, I think Ari told the story on the podcast uh, before, but basically they'll use uh, different words. Like I said, and he once uh, was in China and he was trying to ask for a spoon. In Taiwan, they say tang si, it's like soup spoon. Um, and he kept asking for a tang si, and they didn't understand what he was saying. And uh, eventually he figured out, he like showed them a picture of a spoon on his phone. And eventually they figured out, and uh, he found out that they actually used a different word. Um, and China is obviously huge, and they have like regional uh, probably language differences as well that I'm not super privy to as I've never been there. Um, but yeah, so anyway, it's just like things like that or, um, yeah, there's just a lot of word differences. Like we say in Taiwan, we say lo se tong for trash can and they say la ji tong, which is always really funny to hear. Um, but anyway, all that, th th just all that to say, uh, that there are a number of linguistic differences already. Um, but they're trying to even more move towards uh, a complete difference with Taiwanese, um, which is quite different than Mandarin, um, essentially mutually unintelligible, aside from a, a few words that sound similar. Um, I'm also not a Taiwanese expert, so um, I'll try to speak in broad generalities and, and only to the degree which I understand it. Uh, Ari speaks a lot more Taiwanese than I do, and uh, even he, I think, would readily admit that he understands like 30% of most conversations, maybe, uh, at least when they get complicated. So, uh, yeah, this is interesting, and I also wonder how it will play out with the uh, with other uh, Taiwanese languages or languages used in Taiwan. Um, such as Hakka or any of the native indigenous languages. Um, so we'll see. Um, but yeah, they're saying that there's been, a, a, it says uh, the, uh, Taiji, the Taiwanese has experienced surges in enrollment uh, and m more people are going to take uh, classes. So it says that the number... Um, this is both for people. Re this is for registering to take proficiency tests, uh, both in Taiji and uh, in uh, indigenous languages. Has tripled from forty five thousand in twenty twenty uh, to forty five thousand in twenty twenty from uh, twenty twelve, where it was just sixteen thousand. So it's interesting to see that. Um, I know. I see a lot more um, Taiwanese here in the South since I moved to the South. Um, but there are a lot of things wrapped up in that. <clears throat> I wrote a, a little thread on this before. Um, I, I can't remember if I wrote it on the, the FCP Twitter or on my personal Twitter. but um, And I won't go through all of it right now because I've already been going long on a lot of stuff. Um, but essentially that... You see it more in the South generally. You also see it um, a lot more with older people and then a lot more with like working class people. Um, so there are a lot of uh, social cues that come along with speaking uh, Taiwanese. Uh, so I, I'll be interested to see how this goes because I know um, I get it less in the South, but you still get it from certain people, especially like more upper class people that, that talk to me, basically, why would you want to study that? Um, it's a, it's a useless language. Some people will say, or it's a, um, no one, you, no one speaks that no one uses that, which is obviously untrue. Um, in our neighborhood, it is the, 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 the lingua franca. It's basically what everyone speaks here to communicate, even, uh, young people, uh, which is even more rare to see nowadays. Um, but yeah, even a lot of very young children, when they speak to their, their parents, will speak Taiwanese. And when they speak to someone like me, they'll use Mandarin, of course. Um, so yeah, it's interesting. And I'll, I'm interested to see how, how this push goes. I think they should be pushing, honestly, all of um, the other languages to be studied more, um, including, uh, like I said, Hakka and the indigenous languages, along with uh, Taiwanese. So, um, we'll see. 
Um, but I think it's a good thing. Um, there are, I mean, they're always, uh, obviously also pushing um, the study of English a lot in Taiwan. And uh, Ari and I have shared our skepticism about how how well they're going to be able to meet these uh, deadlines of like full bilingualism by 2030, which I think is a bit ridiculous based on uh, how they're actually planning to go about it. But hey, it's it's a good goal to have, I suppose. Uh, you got to actually do the work to get it done. But hey, um, but I mean, I personally am, am trying to find a Taiwanese tutor right now. So um, I would love more people to speak uh, Taiwanese and for it to be a more acceptable uh, and a more widely used language. But um, yeah, you can see a lot of people saying speaking our mother tongue is a basic human right. Um, this is also uh, goes up against China in a big way because in China they're uh, commonly using Mandarin to wipe out uh, various cultures, whether that's um, various uh Muslim minorities languages, including uh, the Wei or the Uyghurs, um, also in Inner Mongolia and Tibet as well. They're essentially forcing these people to learn languages. Um, you'll get asshats on Twitter that'll say, well, the Uyghur is still on the money. They write Tibetan on the money, so it's not illegal. And um, while that uh, might be somewhat true, oftentimes it is uh heavily heavily discouraged for you to speak it in public if not um there are some allegations that uh, at least in Xinjiang uh, East Turkestan there are cases of people basically being picked up or interrogated for just for speaking uh native languages there so yeah it kind of seems like bs and obviously when you don't allow them to speak it in school which is actually interestingly enough something that happened in Taiwan um, during the martial law period was basically Taiwanese uh, was outlawed, which is another reason why I very, I wouldn't say very few people speak it, but uh, not too many people speak it um, in their everyday lives, especially younger people. Uh, it kind of got rooted out uh, to some degree, though hopefully we will see a resurrection of it. Um, so that's, that's hope, uh, my, my hope anyway. On a less hopeful note, we got COVID stuff. We got Omicron, ladies and gents. It's not good. Um, there's a lot of uh, speculation as to the, uh, how uh, deadly it is. Um, that's all kind of, I think, a it's a little premature to really be talking about the lethality um, of it. But it certainly does seem to be spreading quickly. Um but COVID in general, obviously, is, is not doing well. Um, they're enhancing these quarantine hotel measures, but in, this is in Taiwan, obviously. So the uh, Central Epidemic Command Center, or the CECC, uh, said they're going to implement three measures to improve COVID-19 protection in quarantine hotels because there have been uh, clusters um, in the hotels recently um, of them spreading it through the hotel the hotels, which is obviously not good, especially with Omicron, which seems to be more spreadable and seems to have a, sh a sh like kind of like a shorter um, incubation period in the body, uh, so it spreads quite quickly. Um, it's uh, not good. Yeah, like I said, there was uh, two clusters of COVID nineteen in a quarantine hotel in Taoyuan, uh, eight cases in seven. Uh, infected in the same uh, with the same viral strain uh, in the Taoyuan and then in Taipei there were two cases sustained in adjacent rooms and affected with the same strain so they think that those uh, were obviously spread inside um, uh, of the hotels there now the issue is is that while they are saying that they're going to try to uh, do some investigations like they said they're doing um, some, some of these uh, infection management they're going to check these air ventilation systems etc cetera, etc cetera. they're also trying to do this seven plus seven plus seven uh this lunar new year quarantine program where they're going to basically let people stay in the hotel for seven days and then um they will if they get a negative pcr test then they will be able to go home and do the seven days quarantine um 
I personally think this is a really risky move um, with the with the potential for a false positive. Um, but I don't know. I'm no health expert, but this seems like you're just asking because they say, oh, look, uh, people who are quarantined at home are reminded that they cannot leave their house and they must follow, uh, strictly follow the rules on COVID-19 home declaration and home quarantine notice. OK, so this is this uh, Lunar New Year quarantine program. And also that family members who are living in the same household must also follow the enhanced self health management rules and undergo two mandatory self-paid at home <clears throat> uh, rapid tests on the third and seventh day of the home quarantine. Um, they also are not allowed to share a room or bathroom The issue, or have meals together. The issue with this is how do you know that? I mean, you can, they can do the, the GPS monitoring, um, but if someone doesn't take their phone with them, then maybe they can get away with that. Uh, I, I don't think they're putting ankle bracelets on people. The other issue is how do you know they're not having meals together? And how do you know that the family members aren't going to go outside or go to school and then potentially spread it? Um, I just think this is a really risky, uh, a really risky choice in my opinion. And I'm, I'm not really for it. I, I, I do get people are complaining about the high cost of quarantine, I think that's somewhat fair, and I think that it should be heavily subsidized by the government. But also, that being said, um, a lot of these people are traveling to dangerous places out of uh, on their own volition. Um, and if that's your choice, then you got to deal with the consequences. Um, and if you're traveling for business, then y your company should pay for it. And um, if you were trapped overseas for some reason, um, then maybe the government uh, should should subsidize more of it. But if you're traveling overseas for fun or to visit family, um, that's uh, honestly your choice. Um, there are obviously extenuating circumstances, so it should be dealt with somewhat on a case-by-case -case basis. And I generally think that things like testing um, should be subsidized, which they're not really doing anymore. Um we at uh, the place that I work now have to pay, f starting January, have to pay for our own tests, um, which I think is kind of nonsense. There should be free testing for anyone that wants it. We should increase testing, not uh, decrease it by putting a price tag on it. Um, and I think quarantine hotels should be the same thing. It should be very easy, very cheap to stay in a quarantine hotel um, uh, as long as you're not just running around the, 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 the earth, but uh, just for fun, you know, and potentially getting infected. Um, but again, that being said, I'd rather just pay for everyone and do a universal program uh, and, and, and deal with a small minority of people that are just doing that sort of globe trotting during a pandemic like a, like an absolute psycho. Okay, so yeah, that's kind of how I feel about this. Um, here's a video that I saw that I thought was um, worth looking at uh, because while I have those critiques of some of the things happening in Taiwan, um, overall is fantastic job honestly uh zero cases again today yesterday was zero cases so um uh, local cases i should say we have imported cases quite often um but really good in terms of of, of the domestic handling of this with uh masking and uh contact tracing it's been quite good um so i do have to add that caveat and say that i'm beyond blessed to live in this country um and to have the opportunity to, you know, not not drown in my own bile because uh, my government doesn't give a boop about me. So uh, here's a country called the United States where I used to live, where my family currently lives, where I, uh, they just don't seem to care about anyone. Um, so here's a nurse talking about uh, why he left his job. My name's Andrew, I'm an ICU nurse, and I just quit my job in the hospital working in the ICU. I wanted to talk about a little bit my reasoning why. Um, I'm not the only one that has done this. I'm not the only one that's talked about this. I would also like to say um, I have some um, experience by proxy with this because I have um, a sister who is a nurse, and I also have an aunt who is like a head nurse, um, and she is actually um, in it. My sister, thankfully, uh, works with mothers and babies, so she's had to deal with it a lot less. Um, but 
um, my aunt has been knee deep in it and has um, talked to me and also talked to, I know she talks to my mom often and has basically just said like after multiple shifts, there's just nurses like breaking down being like, I can't do this anymore um, because they're just so overwhelmed. And you'll hear him talk about how uh, just like most jobs in America, um, there's trying to stretch workers uh, thinner and thinner until just, just, just to the breaking point so they can drip and wring every little cent out of it for these uh, uh, multimillionaire and billionaire bosses that run these sorts of these, this privatized healthcare in the United States, which in and of itself is a more absolute moral failing and uh, is disgusting. Um, but I just want to give people a little bit of an explanation of why nurses are doing this. So um, a little quick background, the way it works, a normal patient to nurse ratio in the ICO should be two patients per nurse. Um, the norm right now is probably three patients per nurse every shift. Um, I, some places are doing four <clears throat> with a full ICU and that's months on end. I mean, we've been doing COVID for two years nearly. So you can imagine how often we are in this situation. Uh, med surge floors are probably taking eight patients per nurse, 10 per nurse, hmm. 12 per nurse, some places, and this is nationwide that it's happening. Um, a post cardiac arrest patient, a post code blue patient should be a one to one patient because I'll be in that room for 14 hours straight because there's so much that is involved in keeping that person. That in and of itself is insane. 14 hours straight, uh, working, a, 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 a like a job where you don't really have to do anything for 14 hours straight is insane. Not to mention one where you're on your feet constantly, uh, you're getting, uh, pissed and pooped on and thrown up on screamed at, yelled at, spit on, punched, uh, whatever it is, you know, um, you're watching people die in front of you constantly. Like, <laughs> it's absurd. Uh, I mean, it, it, these people are essentially, depending on what part of the hospital they're working on, but they're, I mean, they're working in basically a war zone right now. And um, all, all that um, politicians have basically done about this whole thing is go, Thank you so much for your service. We really appreciate it. And what I would say is, why don't you show it? Why don't you make these, uh, raise these people's pay? Why don't you make them, uh, every worker for that matter, get hazard pay? Uh, but no. Just make sure you get your booster shot and um, uh, shut the hell up. Get back to work, slaves. That's That's pretty much their message to everyone. Start paying your student loans again, by the way. Get ready to do that because um, it's a priority for the Biden administration. Fucking second bomb. Person alive. <clears throat> but there's been multiple times where I've had two other patients, intubated patients with COVID, and have to take that postcode patient as well in addition. Um, now, staffing in hospitals has been a problem long before COVID. We've been in a health crisis before COVID, but people um, don't want to really talk about that much either we just want it to be normal but um full-time staff have been recognizing they can go work for a travel agency or a contract agency and take contracts with large bonuses and higher hourly wages full-time staff leave travelers are brought in for four weeks nine weeks whatever their contract is then they move on to their next job it's not very um helpful and you don't know what to expect. I mean, I know that comes with working in a hospital, but it shouldn't be, you know, that rocky every shift for staff or charge nurses for nurse managers. Um, you also have less, I would assume, again, I don't have personal uh, experience with this, but I assume you have less cohesion as well because you're, it's, uh, people that you're working with, like he says, for a few months, and they're moving on to the next job. So uh, that seems like you would build less of a, uh, a rapport with these people. You would understand them less. Um, and, you know, uh, every second <laughs> seems to count um, when you're talking about, like, these code blue patients and stuff. And it's kind of hard to have... have Three patients uh, be precepting a brand new graduate nurse, you know, training them 
helping out travel nurses around the unit because they don't know all the policies. They don't know what this doctor wants. Yeah, what they, like that I said, doctor wants. They don't know where everything is. And you're making $35 an hour. They're making $80 an hour, $120 an hour, some of them. Um, this is why more experienced nurses are leaving and hospitals are sucking graduate nurses into two-year contracts. And these nurses are anxious. They're terrified. They don't know how to do this job yet. They're not going to feel comfortable in this job until the one-year mark, maybe. And they're having to do it in outright ridiculous staffing um, conditions and taking workloads that are insane. I know many aspects of labor are experiencing similar things, but we in this field are seeing actual deaths as a result from it every single day. We all know there's no labor shortage. We have nurses. They just don't want to pay them. Mm. So they tell us if we strike, we are abandoning our team and our patients and we care about our patients. So we don't, but that's how they keep control of us. So we need better laws. We need walkouts. We need strikes and we're fed up. They took something that we, this is happening <clears throat> across the United States as we, we saw with like striketober, um, which has been continuing. Um, and, uh, hopefully people are paying attention to that. Um, uh, I may start doing just one day of the week where I just cover all the labor organization that's going on. There's just so much stuff to cover. Like I told you, like I found like all this stuff. I basically got on my, my phone today and I didn't have that much time to read today. Um, today is my uh, half day. So it's a lovely day. So I got to wake up a little later. So I try to catch up on some sleep cause I haven't been doing enough of that lately. Um, and then, I, you know, I found all these stories uh, so quickly, but uh, it seems like I might just have to do uh, at least one day a week of just labor stuff because um, there's so much of it going on. And I feel like a lot of people don't even hear about it. Um, and it's good to see. And it's something the U.S. needs infinitely more of uh, with how downtrodden uh the work has been um and the increase in these like work, right to work for less laws and things like that you can go back and listen to the podcast i have with seth um if i remember i'll 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 throw it in the the description below but if you just go on the website and type in seth you should be able to find uh the two or three podcasts i've done with him um he's a big union guy he was involved in the carpenter strike in uh in washington and um, it's good to see this, but it's still, um, it's really difficult with uh, how basically uh, the United States has legalized the ability to break these strikes. Uh, you can look at what happened with Bessemer, Alabama. Hopefully they're going to get another shot at their union uh, uh, drive. But um, yeah, there's, you know, you win battles and you lose battles. Uh, Starbucks recently uh, organized the union. So these are, these are good steps. Um but we're so far away from from where we were uh, when you know in the you know the golden age of U.S. economics in the middle of the nineteen uh, the sorry the nineteen hundreds the the twentieth century, um, where we had you know forty percent union participation. Now we're at like about eleven, um, and yeah, like I said, hopefully that's going to go back up. But it's going to take. Uh, people organizing their workplaces first of all and also people pushing the politicians to actually pass something um it seems like the biden administration doesn't want to do any of that um domestically they've basically just abandoned all hope you can look at the build back better plan or the um inability and unwillingness to pass the pro act um it's just hard uh to watch while they you know uh, give them these these special monikers of uh, uh, of uh, you know uh, essential workers. Oh, these they're essential, um, but we won't drop one single penny extra into your bank accounts. You're still going to have to work two jobs to feed your children and uh, barely afford your rent. Uh, we're going to restart your student loan payments, but you're essential. We have to have you. Um, which is why we're going to make sure uh, that we squeeze you into the last step, so you have to work. So, um, thankfully at least some people are getting fed up and, uh, there's a big thing now, uh, that you see a lot on Twitter. I don't know if you see it on the other stuff, but I imagine Twitter is the big place to see it, um, of these people basically telling their bosses to, to pound sand and quit. And, um, while that is cathartic and I honestly like to see it, um, 
I I do hope that people quit less and organize more. Um, and uh, you know, it's tough. Uh, I've never organized my workplace. Um, I've usually worked at family businesses, thankfully. So I've had mostly pretty good work experiences. But um, yeah, they we we. we as working class people, uh, we have to start organizing um, and not allowing bosses to 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 continue to screw us. And um, the last point that uh, before we finish this little video here is, um, just like for nurses, just like teachers, they have it even harder when it comes to striking because they will always put oh you're abandoning your patients you're abandoning your students how do you how can you how can you do that how could you just let that and it's like first of all most of the people that complain about this stuff have never been a teacher or a nurse you don't know what it's like you don't know you don't have any idea there was literally a video that came out um of a high school hockey game where they threw uh, five thousand dollars in the middle of the table, uh, in the middle of, of of like a blanket, and made uh these uh, teachers fight over it to to do classroom repair. And if you haven't been inside some of the schools inside the United States, especially uh, rural or inner city schools, you have no idea what it's like. Crumbling textbooks, mushrooms growing on the wall, mold, black mold where where children are. Um, and yet we're having a, a debate about teaching CRT. Uh, we're having uh, uh, debates about uh, if we need, you know, it, it, whether or not we should mask or inoculate these children. It's a joke. Um, the United States clearly does not care about children or teachers or nurses um, or education or health care. Um, and I think it's going to take, again, people getting organized, people pushing for things like ranked choice voting uh, so we can end this insanely trash two-party system that we have going on that just allows two big parties of rich elites that take bribe money from rich people uh, and, and continue on and make sure that they have long uh, careers where they just take these bribes and then when they retire, they go on to a, a, a nice job at a hedge fund um, or as a lobbyist uh, where they can continue the cycle and uh, just trudge up more swamp filth good at and we are proud to do and they made us bad at it because we're stretched too thin and these companies and our leaders do not care about these patients they do not care about our lives and they are actively stealing our lives from us it's well said um and i think it's important i mean you can just do this what i did here just google google nurses google hospitals and you'll see overworked, uh, we should be concerned about Omicron. Um, so this is good. This is good. Alberta nurses getting closer to a union. But, you, you know, you can just see it. We're, you know, we're, we're short-staffed. People are quitting, blah, 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 and the list goes on. But, yeah, you can just see everywhere, overwhelmed. Uh, and a lot of times they try to turn into this, this unvaccinated stuff. Now, honestly... What we should be doing um, is obviously if people want vaccinations, we should make it available to them. Uh, we should also be continuing to wear masks um, because uh, the data shows and uh, you can look at places like Taiwan, masks work. Um, but also so does contact tracing and shutting down borders and not just letting people run around uh, while infected and infecting everyone else. So it's kind of ridiculous. Um, but of course, uh, the biggest thing right now uh, is to go back to normal. But I did see people saying, oh, well, you better not go home to visit your uh, family for Christmas. That's dangerous. Uh, maybe it's better to just stay home. Um, but I haven't heard anything about uh, stop work stoppages, working from home again. We won't talk about that because um, we got to keep this this capitalist system that we've we've uh, has made uh, a, a very small number of people inordinately wealthy. Um, and basically uh, bled dry a lot of the uh, the working class people in this country, and, and it has them, um, you know, a couple hundred dollars away from absolute destitute and homelessness. Um, but we got to keep that system going because uh, that's the only way that we, we can keep the, the gears uh, grinding away. Uh, you can also look up Omicron. There's a lot of really bad takes and spec there's so much speculation uh from this that i think it's it's way too soon to even <clears throat> to even uh 
speculate on this. But, um, oh, Santa. Y'all, <clears throat> it's uh, speaking of uh, just absolutely irresponsible behavior. Santa visiting every house in the world, or at least most of them, uh, despicable. This man needs to be on his own f- freaking naughty list. Just gross. Chris Kringle is a monster. So, <clears throat> this is... um. This is about the um, Kentucky uh, tornado that just happened, uh, which in and of itself is an indictment on on climate change. Now, we can't say that any specific um, uh, weather event is based on climate change, but we can obviously say that see the increase um, is because of climate change. Um, but the read the stories about the tornadoes that just happened. There was like... S- something like seven or eight of them on the ground at the time. Some of these tornadoes were on the ground for, like, close to an hour, which is insane. Uh, Growing up in Tornado Alley myself, a lot of it, a lot of them touched out, and they're horribly violent. I mean, um, I was in Missouri when the Joplin tornado happened. Just horrific. Um, Just heartbreaking, um, is all that can be said. Devastating. Um, But... Uh, you know, those turn a lot of those tornadoes that we were seeing just a couple a decade or two ago, they touch down and and rip through a city, um, and it's horribly devastating. But they don't stay on the ground for an hour; they're down there for a minute, a couple minutes, you know. Um, but anyway, yeah, it's just, just uh, yeah, we need to get serious about climate change. Just and yet another uh, impending disaster that we have. Um, but I think this ties in. I. I uh, pretty well with with also the COVID stories of just um, the the right to refuse dangerous work um, and we're moving in the wrong direction here. But um, there were stories coming out of this Amazon plant in Kentucky where uh, numerous people died. Oh, sorry, this one is not in Kentucky. Um, th- this one was in Illinois. The Amazon factory was in Illinois, and the candle factory was in Kentucky. Excuse me. Um, but the reason that uh, these things are happening uh, is because the reason that the Amazon, the Illinois Amazon factory happened was because basically uh, reports are that workers were told they can't leave. There are text messages, um, I don't know if they included it here, um, saying that they were not allowed to leave. Um, uh, they didn't put it in here, but the, you, you can find it if you just Google it online. Um, they were basically told they couldn't leave, these Amazon employees. Um, and this article is basically just saying that, obviously, we can look right here on the OSHA website, that you do have the right to refuse this dangerous work. So, according to the law, um, your right to refuse to do a task is protected if all of the following conditions are met. All have to meet all of them, which is a bit ridiculous, but... Um, Whereas possible, you've asked an employer to eliminate the danger, and the employee has, uh, the employer has failed to do so. So, I mean, you can't really eliminate tornadoes, so this one's kind of strange. But you refuse to work in good faith. Um, so I, I think if you're there's a tornado and you said, I don't want to work anymore, that's pretty good faith. Um, so this generally means that you generally believe you're in imminent danger. Um, I, a tornado is imminent danger for sure. Um, a reasonable person would agree that the real this is a real danger uh, of death or serious injury. Again, tornado I think is is pretty fair. There isn't enough time due to the urgency of the hazard to get corrected through irregular, <coughs> excuse me, regular enforcement channels, uh, as requested by again, imminent uh, danger from a natural disaster. Again, I think that's true. So I think uh, this tornado obviously meets all these. Um, I would also say. Um, that most uh, companies' COVID protocols also meet this because they don't uh, legitimately protect people. So I think that um, OSHA should be doing a lot more to make sure that workers, especially these essential workers, um, one, are protected, but also the government should be ensuring that they're getting at least one and a half times hazard pay, if not two 2.5 2.5 times with the ridiculousness of this pandemic and if people think that's too much to ask they can either have their employees work from home or they can shut their stores down um they've already gotten paid out from the government and uh, if we really want to uh you know get rid of this disease and not have another six uh, uh mutations of the virus um possibly one that 
I mean, the the initial <clears throat> uh, how it looks with this Omicron is that uh, it's not as deadly. But obviously, that it's a little too early to say that. We don't know what the long term effects of it are. Um, but who's to say that the next one in in four to six months isn't both um, incredibly uh, easy to spread and also incredibly deadly, um, or maybe both of those things and also the vaccines are are zero percent effective against it it's completely possible um so that's i mean that's the future we're potentially heading for now i hope that's not the case i hope that um omicron is the last variant and it gets we get under control with it um but it's incredibly possible that we have another mutation and and just legit, actually, like, I mean, we've lost, in, in the United States, the United States has lost like 800,000 people. I would probably put the estimate above a million uh, just with uh, underreported deaths. But say the number is right, 800,000, that's an insane number of people um, in less than two years or about two years now, I guess. Um, but yeah, what if it what if it really flips on and becomes plague level style where people are just dropping dead um <laughs> yeah so maybe think about getting that under control before it gets there but uh i, I don't have a lot of hope <laughs> uh once again i'll plug ari's article uh elite neoliberalism and the death of the quarantine uh, of course i'll I'll, pay, I'll put this down below um really good article um talking about how Basically, most countries in the world have given up, um, and um, that we've known that that quarantining is the best way since basically the 13th century to deal with these viruses, and we've just, for some reason during this one, we've just given up on it. Um, China is actually doing a huge quarantine right now. I showed it on the last update, um, and they've locked down... Um, an entire city now uh i showed yeah like i said i showed the uh some of the video from last time but uh the update i heard today was that they're saying um w you get to basically pick one family member or one member of each household and they can only leave the house twice uh, a week to buy food uh with special permissions now i don't know what they're doing in terms of like paying these people uh to stay home and stuff but they're locked down that's a lockdown america keeps talking about doing we're doing lockdowns no no no. those aren't lockdowns that's you staying at home unless you don't really want to um china is doing a lockdown now you may not like that um but i would at least like to see america say listen we're gonna shut down anything that's legitimately not uh, uh an essential business i think america's too far gone for this so it's not even really worth uh putting forward but uh you know basically say we'll keep places to get food you can go to curbside pick it up and then go back to your house and we'll do this for two weeks and we'll pay you all full salary to stay home for two weeks um and if you want to work from home you can work from home and um, that's it i mean the christmas holiday is coming up right we can j uh, kids are all gonna be home from school anyway um just stay home everybody sorry do do c zoom christmas and we'll we'll call it the last time we have to do uh, Christmas at home and then lock down the borders and anyone that wants to come in or come out does two week or or three week quarantine before they're allowed in the country <sighs> I don't know read the article folks it's good all right speaking of Jaina let's move over here to Trump the dear leader Trump says that he would not impose boycotts against the Beijing Olympics real this is some real cuck stuff so um he was doing an interview with, with Maria Bartiroma. She's a wonderful woman, folks. Uh, so uh, he was asked if he would impose a diplomatic boycott um, on the 2022 Be uh, Beijing Olympics like Biden has. Trump says, no, because I watched Jimmy Carter do it, and it was terrible. It was terrible. It hurts the athletes. There are much more powerful things we can do than that. Much, much more powerful things. This is not a powerful thing. It almost makes us look like, I don't know, sore losers. Uh, and then he said that he would instead like to see the athletes perform well and win every single medal. Uh, <sighs> so it's uh, kind of ridiculous. 
Um, then you have Saki Bombs over here. Oh, girl boss. She says, I don't think that we felt it was the right step to penalize athletes. So this is asking if they should have just kept done a full boycott. Uh, athletes who have been training, preparing for this moment, and we felt that we could send a clear message by not sending UF official des- uh, an official U.S. delegation. Um, just, again, weak, nonsensical moves. Um, if you want, I mean, no one cares if, if the U.S. officials don't go. Beijing had their feelings hurt a little bit, but deep down they don't care. You're still helping to whitewash, and of course the IOC is going to do this, but the U.S. is sending, not really making a statement. They're saying, well, yeah, you're doing a cultural genocide in Xinjiang. Yeah, you're kind of doing the same thing in Hong Kong. You just took it over, um, doing brutal crackdowns, arresting anyone that voices any sort of dissent. Same thing in Tibet, same thing in Mongolia. You're threatening to, to illegally invade the country of Taiwan. Yeah, whatever. It's fine. It's fine. No big deal. Uh, another big, big cuck that we've known from the beginning has been uh, just loves to get embarrassed. Um, is old Ted Cruz, Lion Ted. Um, he says, mm, "I think it's a mistake to have a full boy kind of the Olympics." We've got young men and women, Americans, who spent their whole lives practicing for this moment. I don't want to punish those young athletes. What we ought to do, I do agree with the notion of the so-called diplomatic boycott. Um, also, leave Heidi the hell alone. Um, yeah, uh, I think it's weak, um, and it's kind of gross, but uh, whatever. I mean, it's, it's classic American uh, pretending to, to be the arbiter of human rights and freedom in the, in, in the world. Um and then kind of being like, well, we do the we do like this ban on sissification, and we do we do like putting Muslims in camps. It's a pretty good idea. So, uh, eh, fuck it. We just won't send the president over. Eh, it's all right. We love sports. Sport ball. In other China news, which this is actually U.S. news, but it has to do with China. <clears throat> There was a Purdue student, we talked about this on uh, the regular pod, but the regular pod's audio is boned, y'all. It's it's bad. It's really messed up. Um, So I'm trying to figure out what to do with it right now. I'll probably end up posting it. I'm going to try to repair it um, the best I can, but I don't think it's going to sound good. So I'll probably post it because there was some good stuff in there. We had some good discussion. Um... But yeah, I'm not sure what I'm going to be able to do with it. It's going to sound bad, and I hate posting bad-sounding audio. So I'm debating whether I should just delete it or if I should just post it uh, and try to fix it up as best I can. But anyway, we talked about this story, um, but I wanted to put it out here just in case I don't post that. Basically, um, there was a a, a critical st- a Chinese student at Purdue University, um, speaking out in support of the protesters killed in the Tiananmen Square massacre. Um, And basically, he was being reported to the Chinese authorities from fellow Chinese students studying at Purdue. Um, And so the uh, president uh, came out and said, any such intimidation is unacceptable and unwelcome on our campus. Purdue has punished less personal, direct, and threatening conduct. Um, if those students who issued threats can be identified, they will be subject to the appropriate disciplinary action. Likewise, students found to have reported another student to any foreign entity for exercising their freedom of speech or belief will be subject to significant sanction. Those seeking to deny those rights to others, let alone to collude with foreign governments in repressing them, will need to pursue their education elsewhere. So this is a good, strong... Um, statement i hope they do it the issue is that figuring out uh who is doing the reporting is going to be insanely hard so probably not a lot of students are going to be banned for this but it is good to see um the president of purdue coming out and making a strong statement in favor of freedom of speech because we should be supporting that and we should be fighting for it and we should not allow 
I think we should open other people, people, people from other countries with open arms to come study at our universities. I think we should also be letting our own citizens study for free. Um, also go to trade schools for free, but forgive some student loan, Joe Biden. He said he's going to f- forgive a minimum of $10,000 of student loans. And like I said, he's restarting payments and he's not canceling any of them. Hmm. <laughs> thanks. Most progressive president since FDR. Uh, but, um, yeah, I think we should allow students from other countries to come into our country and, um, one, uh, let people from our country interact with people from other countries uh, to maybe be a little less uh, xenophobic, but also for cultural exchange. I think that's great. It's fun. um, It's interesting. And it's, I mean, especially for universities, that's how you learn, right? You interact with people of differing ideologies, different cultures, um, different backgrounds, etc. And that's incredibly important. Um, I think that was the best thing that I learned from college, maybe the only thing I learned from college. Um, That and how to pretend to read a book. Uh, (laughs) But... Uh, it also lets uh, maybe people from slightly more oppressive countries come here and, and, you know, there's a lot of critiques to have about the U.S., but in terms of freedom of speech, um, in terms of uh, freedom in general, sometimes maybe a bit too far, um, we are quite free. And um, the freedom of speech thing is the, is the big thing and also freedom of the, of the media. Now, our media is bought and sold for the most part. That's why y'all come here. But... I will say, um, freedom of speech is probably the freest in the whole world it is in America, which allows a lot of stupid people to scream, um, but it also allows for real discussion. Um, And so, um, frank discussion like that, I've seen uh, people from, I won't even name any any specifics at all, but people that I interacted with in university uh, that came from some of these places, I noticed them open up and change. Um, and some of them didn't want to go back to those countries afterwards and actually ended up staying in the United States. Some of them did go back, and they've told me that they've had um, some conversations. Obviously, if you live in a repressive regime, you can only say so much. Um, but they've kind of talked um, in private with some of their friends and some of their relatives, um, and it has opened up some eyes. So I think that, that, that that's definitely a big positive. But we can't allow is for people to come from other countries and do things like this. Um, And it's not just China, obviously. There's a number of uh, repressive regimes, um, including ones that are good buddies, like Saudi Arabia, um, which Biden just uh, made sure that we could sell weapons to again, um, as if they didn't murder uh, a U.S. resident journalist uh, just a couple years back, chopped him up in an embassy, but uh, whatever. They got that good oil, y'all. They got that pure, that good China white, black tar, mm, good stuff that we love. Um, So, yeah, we're going to continue to do that so they can continue to do war crimes in Yemen, kill children, do blockades, uh, starve people to death. It's it's on America, y'all. It's on Saudi Arabia, but it's... We're putting the gun in their hand, like literally. <laughs> so, uh, anyway, um, this is another China story, which seems based at first, but is actually pretty cucked. Um, try to bar celebrities from showing off their wealth and extravagant pleasure on social media, saying pop stars must comply with core socialist values. Now, they don't have to comply with core socialist, like, Marxist principles that would say, like, we need to redistribute this wealth. Now, we don't have to do that. Um, but what they do need to do is keep it off social media, okay? We, what we need to do is keep that... Shh. We're not going to pay everyone the same. We're not going to, like, increase the wealth for the lower... I mean, yeah, our poverty level is still going to be a dollar a day. Um, we'll also use slave labor from Uyghur Muslims. But... You need to pretend, okay? We're all going to play pretend and pretend that this is some sort of beautiful socialist paradise run by a poo bear. Um, Yeah, so basically that's what it is. is They're they're basically saying they're not allowed to get online uh, and and show off. Um, Yeah, so what I wish they would do, and this would be based, and I would give them credit for it, is if they were like, listen here, rich people. Now, they don't want to do this because obviously... the CCP members are all rich as hell and ex- use their wealth um, and power to exploit uh, to get more wealth and do corrupt deals, but also to do things like uh, violate women, um, which we've seen with the Pong Sai case and uh, 
though that did start allegedly consensually. So, but anyway, it's uh, there are a number of cases, obviously, um, of this. And recent, actually, I forgot to include this, and I'll probably do a, another story about this soon. Um, but recently, basically, China said this whole sexism thing. Let the government handle it. Don't protest online. Don't write about it. Just be quiet, and we'll handle it. the The majority male government, the with our legislature that has twenty five. Even though women hold up half the sky, we all know this. It's a cl- classic quote. When our legislature is only twenty five percent women, and there's zero women on the Politburo, which is holds the real power, well, you should let the men handle it. Okay, women, why don't you be quiet? Let, the, the boys got this one, all right? We're going to deal with this sex thing. Don't you worry about it. We got it. Uh, so, yeah, I, I'm i sure uh, Me Too activists and women are very... Uh, have had their fears uh, absolutely assuaged. So, we'll see. Anyway, ah, oh, I let you guys see it. I was... Dang it. I mean, I guess you can see it in the URL anyway. Anyway, pretend you didn't see that. So... This is a funny story. I thought I'd end with this one because it's a little more lighthearted. We've been on a roller coaster of emotions here, folks. And I'm sorry I have to do this to you. I usually start out thinking, this is going to be fun. And then I realize that I can't really tell jokes when I'm by myself. Um, it's hard for me. I'm, I, I don't have a, a Tim Dillon style sidekick that can laugh at all my uh, middle tier jokes. Um, so, you know, here we are. Uh, we have some rough stories. But this one's a fun one. Okay, so on December 13th, uh, the moderator of a Weibo sub, uh, super topic page, which I assume is like a subreddit, um, dedicated to Uno Santan, Uno Santa, this guy's name, Uno One Santa, uh, a Japanese member of a Chinese boy band, he reposted a People's Daily commentator of, uh, commemoration, excuse me, of the Nanjing Massacre and added the caption, we should not despise a nation because a small cadre of militarists in their midst instigated an invasion. Those few militarists are guilty of war, not the people. Yet at no time should we ever forget the serious crimes of the invaders. End quote. We mourn so that we may remember. We remember so that we may look we we may better move forward. End quote. Sorry, I ended the quote too early. Uh the moderator uh immediately came under attack from Little Pinks. Little Pinks are Xiaofen Hong, which is like uh, uber nationalists in, uh, on, online in China. Okay? Kind of like you've probably heard us use the word umao before. Those are uber nationalists, but those ones are paid uber nationalists online. These are just uh, good old-fashioned nationalists. Um, so he came under attack from these people. He or she, I actually don't know who... If it's a, a man or a woman, pardon my misgendering. Um, understanding why and why the little pink's onslaught was folly, offer a snapshot of the mood on the Chinese internet. It is very nationalistic, by the way. I've gotten a lot of these things. So they're heaping vitriol, um, um, basically saying this person uh, was excusing the World War II atrocities, calling him a race traitor, a Japanese devil. And in saying, what right do you have to forgive on behalf of our ancestors? You idolize pop stars so much you've lost your mind. Um, so uh, nationalism and fan culture is kind of what they're talking about here in their um, intersection. Um, and like I said, they're doing trying to do a crackdown on fan culture um, in China, which honestly, you shouldn't have, you shouldn't have heroes. No heroes. Um, get rid of it. Uh, no more hero worship. Um yeah, it's it's not good. So stop doing that. Um, so anyway, this is for the commemoration, of, the commemoration of the Nanjing massacre, which was very brutal. Um, so here's the issue, though. Amidst the frenzied atmosphere, none of the little pinks attacking Klaus uh, noticed a crucial detail. The Weibo post was a quote. Hmm. But who is the quote from? Dun 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 dun. dun. Gigi Bing. So he did this in a 2014 address commemorating the massacre. So according to uh, the Little Pinks, Gigi Bing is a race trader, folks. <laughs> Hell yeah, brother. I second that. I think he should be put on trial and 
put in one of those vans that they have. And if you know, you know what I'm talking about. Okay. That's it. Um, Gigi Bing, race trader. That's good to hear. I love it. You love to see it, folks. Um, so, go check out our website, y'all. They, they keep trying to get... I clicked on this in the last one. If it was actually a real person, I would click on this ad every time to go talk to these people to try to see why they're... But they just want me to give them my email address so they can send me spam. But anyway, this is the only one that I've had to deal that with. Most of them are... Most of the ads I get on the website are... Which, also, please get rid of that ad blocker. Boom. Stop it forever. And then um, if you see any interesting uh, advertisements... Um, just give them a click, and you can open them and check out what's going on. And if you, oh, I need to go pick up my Wubei Dread. Um, if you see anything interesting like these uh, delicious goodies, you can uh, go ahead and buy it, and that will help us out a lot. Um, it like a lot. It really does help us. Um, so yeah, please do that. Also, make sure to go read Ari's article. Um, you can go listen to all the posts. Um, like I said, if you uh, don't want to go on YouTube, you can also go to... I've clicked on this ad too much because I was trying to show you guys on the stream and now they're uh, now they're they're mad at me. But I will, I'll post the um, YouTube in here so you can actually watch it on here uh, as well. So if you don't want to go to YouTube, you can watch uh, the embedded version here on the website. So do that. Uh, we appreciate it. And if you have real money to throw away, you can come over here and become a little Patreon member. Um, you can join at whatever whatever level you want, folks. Um, uh, even as little as $3 a month will go a long way to helping us. And uh, we would appreciate it. So anything you can do, um, even if you're too lazy to go click on the easily clickable uh, interesting advertisements, you can uh, just share with your friends. Share via word of mouth. Um, come hang out with us when we do these live streams. I'm doing live streams, folks, like nearly every day. I did a, I did a, like a three hour live stream last night. I think um, playing uh, Insurgency Standstorm. But uh, if you guys want to play something, I'll play with. Uh, we'll, 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 we'll play something. Uh, if you got videos that you think are interesting, I'll do like live reacts and stuff. I've been thinking about getting a couple videos together to do live reacts. Um, and we can go through it, uh, together, make fun of stuff, uh, have a good old time. So yeah, we're doing that. I'm also trying to have some, I'm trying to line up some guests to come on. Um, and like I said, I'll probably post that other, um, podcast that we did sometime soon. So you can come check that out too. But that'll be said, uh, get in our DMs or whatever, message us, comment on the stuff. Um, let me know what you guys want to see. If there's any uh, games you want to see me stream or if there's any topics, news articles that you think are uh, important that we, we missed or should be covering, um, or you just want to send us some love, we'd appreciate that too. So, I'll talk to you soon, folks. I love you. And um, you know the deal. The FCP. Good. Oh.